Uh, well, welcome everyone for joining us today uh, at the uh, another workforce development virtual panel that the SCALES Consortium is, has organized in the field of microelectronics. Uh, my name is Jack Judy and I'm a faculty member at the University of Florida and uh, a member of SCALES and I've done a lot to help coordinate the workforce development efforts within SCALES and uh, this, uh, this set of webinars has been, has been quite good. Let me, let me go talk about this a little bit. We have, of course, the motivation for this workforce panel is obviously driven by the Chips for America Act. Uh, this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to not only address national needs, but, but to do so by scaling up and improving workforce development in this space. Uh, for those that are interested, there's a 95 page document provided by uh, NIST uh, defining workforce development planning for folks interested in teaming with scales or others in responding to this uh, unique opportunity. We look forward to, to teaming with you. We're already teaming with many. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, you know, we are some of it. Well, I'm in the state of Florida and, uh, you know, when the semiconductor Industry Association did a study of the states with the highest number of semiconductor employees. Of course, there was California, Texas, Oregon, Arizona, very significant, but I'll note that Florida uh, is number five. Uh, that might be a surprise to many of you, but uh, Florida actually has a long history of having a strong activity in the semiconductor space. And, and there are others in the, the Southeast region that are active in this research area as well. Uh, and uh, so I think the Florida and the Southeast is well positioned to experience substantial workforce growth, workforce growth, and I think we have a role to play. Successfully developing a workforce in this area requires teaming between industry, the state, and various training organizations. Uh, some of this may come up uh, in the presentations or discussions. Uh, and uh, through my experience in engaging with these uh, uh, stakeholders, everybody is really eager to team to make this uh, a successful reality. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, we've already had three panels, uh, three virtual panels. The first one was just focused more on the, just general microelectronic space. Next one was more on heterogeneous integration and packaging. The most recent one was on secure computing. And then of course today is workforce development in the space of AI and ML hardware. So I'm very excited to see this panel and what they have to share. And so I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing and introduce uh, Gloria Kim. Gloria Kim will be the moderator of this panel and uh, later Swarup Bunya will also be joining. He's a co-organizer of the, of the whole virtual panel uh, system. And uh, Gloria is a professor in the engineering education department here at the University of Florida. Uh, and has been partnering to really advance things in this space. And we're eager to have her leadership at today's panel. So Gloria, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Welcome again to the workforce development for AI and machine learning hardware emphasis of this final session of the workforce development panel discussion. So this panel brings together stakeholders from industry, academia, and government with a specific focus on identifying the workforce development needs in the Southeast region. So as Jack just pointed out, we already had three panel discussions, and this is the fourth one. If you missed any of this, um, there is a link here, and these slides will be shared later, where you can find the previous full 90 minute recording of every single session that has happened on March 31st, April 14th and April 28th. So this is how it's gonna go today. We have six distinguished panelists today. I am very honored to share the space with them. So we're actually at right now at the introduction uh, about eight minutes in, I guess. So we're right on time. Each panelist who I will introduce um, collectively first um, we'll have a position statement, about five minutes. Some have slides, some don't. And then we'll follow up with a interactive Q&A sessions. Um, hopefully there'll be a lot of questions like we have had in the previous three sessions. It was a very lively and thought provoking discussion. And then we'll come back to the panelists with their concluding remarks about one to two minutes each. 
Okay, so if you have any questions, you may use the raise hand function. So it will bring you up in the queue on the video, or you can just simply unmute yourself and ask the question. And there's also a Q&A feature on the Zoom that you can use the chat function in this case. So with those logistics out of the way, let me just give you this list of panelists who are joining us today. So we have Steve Trimberger, Terry Back, Helen Lee, Raj Pulugurta, Andrea Ramirez Salgado, and Mercia Stan. And I'm your moderator today. So let me start out by introducing the panelists. Um, so first up is Dr. Trimberger, and he is a foremost expert in the FPGA. So he retired from Xilinx in 2017. He um, um, also, at some point, was the manager of DARPA, and he developed, he developed low temperature and high performance devices. He's currently president of the Trimberger Family Foundation, which he has also founded with programs in science and technology education. He was elected into the Academy um, in 2016 for his contributions. Next up, we have Terry Back. Terry is a 35 year veteran of the electronic design automation industry and sales and sales management. He's currently the sales director at Synopsys. He has worked previously for Cadence Design Systems and Biologic Systems, and now 22 years at Synopsys. Prior to joining the EDA industry, Terry was an analog IC designer at Harris Semiconductor. He earned his BSEE from the University of Central Florida. And then we have Helen Lee. She is the Claire Booth Luce Professor and the Department Chair of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Duke University. Her current research focuses on neuromorphic computing systems, deep learning acceleration and security, memory design and architecture, and high performance and energy efficient computing systems. She is a fellow of ACM and IEEE. And we have our panelist, um, Dr. Pula Gortha. Raj is an associate professor at the Florida International University with more than 360 publications in electronic packaging, including book chapters um, with three, um, a part, as a part of three packaging textbooks. He led several, uh, several technical advances in electronic packaging, working with a whole ecosystem, including dozens of semiconductor packaging <clears throat> material tool and end user companies. He has co-advised and mentored more than 35 graduate students, many of whom are working with leading companies such as Apple, Texas Instruments, Intel, Qualcomm, IBM, Google, Broadcom, and many other major companies. Next, we have Andrea Ramirez Salgado. She's a doctoral student and she's funded by an NSF grant. She works on developing hands-on, gamified, and equity-based curricula to teach AI, IoT, and hardware principles to high school and undergraduate students from any engineering major. Her academic background as a software systems engineer, combined with a master's degree in education in ICT, and her current work in the educational technology doc doctoral program gives her a systemic, perspective of the best practices for teaching engineering related concepts to foster engineering identities, which can influence students' career decisions and persistence. And last and not least, we have Mercia Stan. Um, he's the Virginia Microelectronics Consortium Professor at the University of Virginia. He is teaching and doing research in the areas of AI hardware, Processing and Memory, Cyber Physical Systems, Spintronics, and Nanoelectronics. He's the Director of Computer Engineering, leads the High Performance Low Power Lab, and is an Associate Director at the Center of Automata Processing. Um, he's a fellow of the TriEEE. So with that introduction, these are the backup seat questions in case um, this audience does not ask any questions, which has never happened. So, um, but these are the fallbacks that I will rely on if we have to use them. So um, I'll stop sharing here. 
and we'll start with a five minute statement by each of the panelists. And we have Steve, you going first. All right, thank you. Uh, but yeah, first audio check, can you hear me just fine? Well, let's go. So I'm going to, uh, well, let me start a little bit of background. So I've come out of commercial industry, uh, not out of education, although I have, taught at the university and the secondary school and uh, uh, sort of stood in a bit at, uh, uh, in, uh, in middle schools. So I got some exposure and I've taught at, at the undergrad and graduate level, but mostly uh, I'm on the other side of this equation. I'm not developing, I've been hiring. I've hired a lot of engineers and I've not hired a lot of engineers. So, uh, I'm looking at this from a little bit different perspective. And I'm not going to talk too much about that. What I'm going to do is probably, um, well, say some things that hopefully will be a bit controversial uh, and, and then uh, we'll sort of maybe get this conversation off the rails. I think we're cutting this whole problem wrong. What I believe, I believe in the old adage, you farm where the soil is good. Where's the soil good in engineering? Who are these people and what attracts them? And what I see are, is I see engineering as a career choice for the introvert, the socially awkward, the unconnected and disadvantaged. You don't have to know somebody, you don't have to be somebody. And if you do know somebody and you, can, and you are somebody, you don't have to do engineering. Uh, and so efforts to try to make engineering attractive by adding a social dimension are somewhat counterproductive. So, uh, you know, that, that the, the, the stereotype uh, introverted engineer, you know, there are some truths in the stereotype and it's not necessarily that it's uh, the engineer that makes the, the introvert, the introvert rate makes the engineer. So how do we track those? And I'm going to sort of lay that out there and say, you know what? Uh, you know, hey, I, I was a mentor in the first robotics, big social kind of thing. And the best engineers were pretty well intimidated by the whole thing. So yes, we do like them in the industry. Um, we do want people who are articulate. We do want that, uh, but let's not shut them out of the process. And I'm concerned that many of the proposals have been doing that. So anyway, that's kind of a, an introductory thing. We can we can talk about that more if we like. How do we how do you attract an introvert? Steve, if I could ask you a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to clarify, you said let's not shut them out of the process. Can you can you just confirm on the the, the introvert or what, what were you speaking of there? Yeah. So so uh, pretty you know the, the, the introvert and the awkward. And if we put if we set up programs to force them, yeah. So all of us here, us speaking on the panel, we're clearly not. Of course, I, I best closet introvert or something like that. But, but uh, I that was how I perceived myself forty years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, uh, if we put together programs that are socially driven, the ones that are uh, sort of more, more fun to the HR department and. Uh, marketing yeah to, to in my domain uh then yeah then then these people step to the back and uh and they may step out of the process what is the process are we training or are we filtering are we training new engineers or we put into to get into into, into position a process where people who don't fit through the holes in the filter don't move on they don't get into to, to engineering school. They don't get into grad school. They don't get the jobs. They drop, they go somewhere else. And, uh, and, and we, we, we've seen that too. So how do we keep them in the, in the process? How do we make it comfortable and valuable? So I, I'm gonna turn the corner now. That was the, sort of my first point. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna move on because I wanna move on to the topic. Uh, so yeah, so Steve took up most of his time talking about off topic, but that's just me. Uh, so let's talk about AI and ML. And actually, I see two parts of this. Um, there's the uh, there's the development of it, and then there's the use of it, and both are pretty interesting. The development. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, I started my career in electronic design automation, and uh, we, the way that runs is you have these tools, you 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 have a have a process to uh, automate the design, and then you have a benchmark suite. And the and the joke was, oh yeah, the the the, the tools eventually learn the, the learn the benchmark suite. Uh, but that was done in in the olden days. That was done by with a human in the loop that would look at the bench, look at the result, and modify the set of rules that that human had codified to do the optimization. Uh, well, the way we do that, the way we do that now, of course, what is, how does what does machine learning do? Uh, well, it it does that without the human in the loop. So it's inter it's an interesting perspective, but the problem is uh, you 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 could learn from the benchmark suite, and I saw this done with humans in the loop and without. They could learn the wrong things, and so you so de developing uh, you know, these embedded machine learning systems needs that con needs that control. All right, how do you know you've actually developed the the right uh, codification? inside that machine learning. And it's actually pretty difficult to do. And so maybe there's a, there's a middle ground and that's kind of maybe something we can do in the, in the training our next generation engineers of how to deploy this programming technique. You know, machine learning is to my mind in a, in a way very more similar to uh, dynamic programming or pipelining. It's a technique that you apply. It doesn't apply to everything, but it does work for some things. The other half of this was that was uh, using it. So we're looking at uh, if if uh, if you are uh, if you're any kind of fun engineer, you played with Chat GPT and tried to get it to solve your problems. Uh, and uh, I'm you know anybody want to collaborate with a book about how to get how to get uh, AI to do your homework for you? Uh, I'm on it. Uh, but uh, but that but that's only this the only sensible thing to do. The real problem is not using it but how to use it, how to ask the right questions. Because if you've used it, you've threw in your first few questions and it came out with uh, intelligent sounding nonsense uh, or intelligent sounding barely passable. Uh, you know, better than somebody who doesn't know anything, but not as good as somebody who does know. So that's the next start. There's this new skill that's going to be required for using whether it's ChatGPT or Copilot or whatever, how do you craft your queries into this AI to get good results out? And so that's a you know for I'll lay that out there and say okay, well, what new skills is machine learning going to require of our workforce? How do we uh, how do we deliver those? So, so I'll, I'll pass on the baton here. Thank you. That was exactly five minutes. <laughs> Next, we have, <laughs> Next, we have Terry. Okay. Uh, Gloria or Harry, if, uh, if you could permit me to share a screen. And so, just a couple of slides out of this uh, this deck by uh, one of our directors in our AI group. And this leads to this first slide leads to workforce development, right? So, the topic of of the conversation here is workforce development with uh, automated intelligence or machine learning. And one of the um, uh, statistics that is somewhat troublesome is that by the year 2030, and this uh, slide shows in the US, uh, we're expecting to have about a 23,000 uh, engineer workforce shortage by the year 2030. And and so why is that, right? It's It's, well, there's more demand on on products that require electronics, and so there's a lot more need for uh, engineers. Um, but you know, the other flip side is that we're graduating less uh, talent as engineers. Right, kids are going to college, and they're not necessarily selecting the sciences. Uh, you know, they they want to go into finance and be on Wall Street or, or you know other curriculums that they might pick. But um, you know, engineering, chemistry, computer science, you know, those aren't necessarily the cool jobs. And, you know, as Steve says, maybe, you know, maybe partly it's the introvert that gets attracted uh, to those. So from a synopsis perspective and just, you know, a, a 30 second commercial on what do we do, you know, what do we see on how do we try to solve this is 
we're taking our products and this is sort of the test or not necessarily the test suite, but the design flow of doing an integrated circuit chip, right? So for those on the phone that might not be familiar, if you have a, an Apple iPhone or an Android phone, any of the chips that are inside there uh, before they become uh, chips, uh, some engineer uses uh, software to design and develop those chips. So we're taking a lot of uh, AI, a lot of machine learning. We've been at this since around 2017. Uh, we announced our first product in 2020, which is the center one there, the, uh, the Fusion Compiler DSO.AI. And so we're trying to wrap our whole uh, portfolio suite around that for the purpose of closing that gap of engineers and the need for engineers to create uh, more productivity out of the existing engineers that are there today and to ramp up quicker new engineers out of college so that they're more productive as they enter the workforce and don't require you know, uh, 20 or 30 years of experience to become a, a very proficient uh, engineer. So you know, that's the kind of the aspect that, that we look at. You know, from um, the workforce type thing, you know, my perspective is that we need to encourage, right? So from an industry perspective, as a hiring manager, Steve is a hiring manager, you know, he mentioned that he hires and doesn't hire certain people. Well, you, you can't hire the people that you, you that don't come across to you, right? And I think one of the things that the U.S. can do better is make it cool for kids to get into STEM, provide some incentives for kids to get into STEM, right? So, you know, today, for example, you know, you know we offer a lot of Pell Grants and other, uh, you know, funding by uh, the government that's backed, right? All the kids have student loans. You know, let's, let's put some more emphasis on student loans for the things that maybe are important for the U.S., right? So we've got the CHIPS Act. Clearly, we think in, uh, semiconductors are important. Um, you know, let's put, you know, extra effort uh, behind that, because the more kids that can get graduated from the universities that industry can hire, then uh, not necessarily the more kids from university, more STEM kids that graduate from the universities, the more industry has opportunity to hire those students. So I'll uh, give it back to you, Gloria. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Helen. Sure. Uh, may I share my screen quickly, too? Hi, this is uh, Helen speaking. And as um, um, I'm with the university, I guess, and one of our uh, major focus is the education. And in fact, then for the workforce and development, and um, the biggest challenging, uh, the biggest challenge, um, in fact, is in the pipelines. And how can we continuously uh, supply the uh, talent to our graduate study and then to uh, our industrial partners? Um, so um, in Duke ECEs, and we have put a lot of efforts and apply different models. One of the model actually is to leverage and our existing research centers and institute. And since today we're talking about the workforce development and particularly for the AI, I use an uh, NSF and AI Institute on Edge Computing Athena as the example. And here is our education and workforce development and the broaden participation uh, goals. And very importantly, I wanted to highlight is our primary first three goals is to increase awareness, interest, and knowledge in this an AI related research themes for K-12 students, undergraduate students, and graduate students. Um, in the past, I think at the university levels, and we pay high attention to undergraduate students and undergrad, uh, undergraduate students levels. Well, in fact, we find that the, the pipeline is not sufficient. We must educate the uh, students at early stage in order to enable their sufficient students and comes to uh, the higher education mm -hmm. in, in STEM and in AI uh, hardware. Um, and here, in fact, is an, um, our Athena ecosystems. Again, uh, we put a tremendous effort and developed embedded STEM labs. And these are the examples and uh, we applied here. Well, this is the models that we applied. Again, um, the core is um, research practice and partnerships. And in our engaged partners, like in universities, uh, faculty, 
students, alumni, and industries and can easily be attached. And this is the uh, common model. Um, we put in very high efforts in order to enable community collaborations. So this including um, certain kind of a fun um, uh, uh, opportunities and for uh, K-12 students. It's also um, uh, engaging with the, some um, kind of particular programs and um, like in um, inspire minds, like be socials. And um, these are um, uh, activities and to include the students and who is surrounding this area. Um, in fact, and we also provide in certain curriculums and well developed curriculums and also online programs and studies and communities and, and encourage the professors and students to take these in courses. Um, of course, and we work very closely with the college like NCN Piang this. Um, so from the two ends are potential support and offered and from our uh, core research and practice and partnerships. Um, I do have a lot of examples, and but here, since this is a panel, I will omit those in details. And but um, you know, through the the first two years and of the uh, Athena's, we find there are still a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges is, and uh, when we in order to engage in this and students, um, and also continue tracking their participants, and there is no. Um, you know, very effective and measure tools. And this is what we are trying to do is and develop some shared measure tools and help us as to tracking and following the uh, progress of the students. Um, and take for our uh, REO programs and um, we tend to shape our plan to embed it, um, STEM labs as to enhancing K2 file impact. And from higher associate in research, we increase in faculty support and also nonprofit interactions. Uh, we also um, are working to uh, develop the mechanisms for undergraduate engagement in the workforce development. Um, so here is our plan for the next two years. Um, again, the effort will cross and um, you know different levels. And the particular for the K-12, and as you can say, the plan include um, summer camp, include and some short of and, uh, studio sessions. And uh, we highly encourage your, um, uh, you know, um, uh, recruit and college individual research. Uh, we also tend to extend nationwide and partnerships. And right now we work with uh, Florida uh, on this. And of course, and for particularly um, activities like Lego League and charging, um, there are also many robotic and hardware related um, uh, uh, competitions and that'll be our aim as well. So again, um, I guess, and we have a very strong research in the field um, and our next effort is in trying to help build the pipeline and enhance this uh, 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 effort. That's conclude my five minutes. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Raj. Hey, uh, good morning. And let me also pull up some slides. I thought it will help my narration, even though I didn't originally plan for it. So our view is that you know the packaging uh, hardware integration is a true new discipline that has to be introduced into the engineering. So the previous uh, education system where you try to you know, inculcate the core disciplines, which are always important, like you know, digital circuit design, analog circuit design, I mean the material science, maybe process kinetics, mechanics. While those things are important, I think at the very young age, maybe in the undergrad curriculum, uh, students should get exposed to the cross-disciplinary aspects of uh, engineering. And if you can see my screen, can you? We yeah. can. Can yeah, you put it on presentation like mode? Sorry? Could you please put that in presentation mode though? Because right now we're seeing your... It'll enlarge it. Okay, maybe... Um...
Is this better? Yes. Thank you. So basically, uh, sorry, you can see that uh, packaging is truly interdisciplinary because it brings in uh, the pitch scaling, five nanometer transistors going to, you know, 30 micron bumps, the off-chip interconnections going to maybe 400 micron uh, board level interconnections. And that thinking is changing. Now you're getting to almost uh, five nanometer transistors going to one micron interconnections, maybe 30 micron today, but eventually it'll be one micron. The thermal problem, you are producing heat at 10 watts per millimeter square. The mechanics problem, you want to bring large interposers into the middle that have a lot of organics. That So it's a truly in, interdisciplinary science. And when we teach this, in fact, we have an interdisciplinary course that brings in both uh, electrical, mechanical, biomaterial engineers into the same class. And we cover all these uh, engineering aspects. So why not create a whole engineering discipline on uh, heterogeneous integration, starting from even maybe the junior year, so that uh, students see the value of this interdisciplinary education, they see the need for uh, the market evolution, like what was pointed out by the previous speakers on how this future computer engineering brings a very good, perfect convergence between the AIML hardware needs, the embedded software for security, the multi-physics uh, challenges that deal with electrical, mechanical, thermal, new polymer chemistry, and the nanomaterial science behind it. So that is the goal, and that should be the idea that we create this highly interdisciplinary uh, this, uh, curriculum that, that basically let students uh, get a specialization so that they are prepared for this future. And hence, when they you know graduate, they are directly seeking to be a part of this uh, industry so that there is no shortage for the workforce. Otherwise, you know, we have most students just directly seeking to go to, you know, computer science or traditional IT fields because they get more lucrative salaries there. They don't see the value of this uh, future need. And we lose the jobs to Asia like we have been doing for a long time. The other aspect of it is the new integration opportunities. When we integrate this uh, functions into the package, we can provide more solutions. For example, towards secure computing, I think we have some opportunity to bring in new power delivery network into the package so that we can eliminate some of the information leakage. And that's one aspect that we can develop a very synergistic solutions and uh, provide nice power delivery solutions that automatically prevent uh, information leakage. There is also the RF solution, you know, the RF technology, the wireless communication technology can provide a lot of solutions towards secure computing, dynamic shielding, reconfigurable shielding between different systems, subsystems, so that uh, you have less opportunity for information leakage. So you need to understand the evolution of this uh, RF uh, wireless communication integration, again, still based on heterogeneous integration technologies that brings in all the you know, embedding, the multi-scale, multi-physics, the integration of uh, electromagnetics with uh, high-speed digital, the so-called mixed signal, and then the thermal problem that brings this uh, cooling and uh, you know cooling of 10 watts per millimeter square or even more. So the true interdisciplinary aspect has to be highlighted. So what can, uh, and I represent MSI, uh, less like uh, minority serving institutions, and what can we do about it? Basically, MSIs have uh, their relatively young universities compared to the more mature and senior universities uh, that are. So obviously we are infrastructure lagging. So I think there has to be very good seamless access between infrastructure. So while we have all these nice uh, core ide ideas and core themes, you know, there are a few good ideas and everybody works on them everywhere. But where we lag is the infrastructure to access, uh, you know, for example, a five micron Chip to chip to chip bonding, or you know, a, you know, ten micron VI in an interposer. So then, nice new infrastructure that needs to be accessed by people across the country. So that that will help. Uh, I think this chip act will help in providing that seamless infrastructure, so students can access them. And uh, that's one aspect where minority serving institution can benefit from this kind of. Uh, 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 acts or this kind of initiatives. 
The second part of it is uh, obviously there, you know, how we create this massive diversity workforce. One is, yeah, catch them young, like the previous speaker said, in, in, believe, you know, create this uh, engineering temper at a very young age in high school, because most of the minority serving institutions, we are very privileged to have almost 40% FTIC, first time in college. If you think about it, you know, we proudly say we have generations of professors and doctors in our families. But first time in college, you know, the students have different priorities. They work 10 hours the weekend before their final exam. So you need to also tell them the priorities and maybe help them from up these economic constraints so that they can focus on um, these uh, high-tech careers in their school and college. So they're not compelled by their economic constraints. And uh, so the workforce development should include all this uh, access across infrastructure, more uh, government industry initiatives, and we benefit from all of them, IUCRC, PFI, SBIR, we have all kinds of NSF uh, industry initiatives, we have direct industry engagement, and these should be more broader across multiple universities so that we can create this workforce uh, across all the disciplines. So I think in summary, I guess uh, what we are trying to say is create a very cross-disciplinary curriculum in packaging and hardware integration. Let students see the value that all engineering disciplines converge towards heterogeneous integration. All engineering is packaging engineering and uh, you know, packaging engineering, everybody is a packaging engineer, it's just that they don't know. So we just have to provide that awareness that you are solving this big heterogeneous integration problem so they are prepared for that big market appropriately. So I don't know if I'm at five minutes, but I keep talking till someone stops me. Thank you. <laughs> you just made it. Thank, Thank you, you for nice. that insight. Hey, let me invite Andrea to share her perspective. Can you see my screen right now? No. Not yet. Oh, now we do. Okay. All right. So, um, well, first of all, I am excited to be uh, today in this panel. Thank you for inviting me. I, I hope not to repeat like a lot of things that have been mentioned before. And uh, before I start, I want to note that the insights that I will provide here are informed by my position as a Latina engineer, but also as an educational researcher and instructor of engineering related courses, but also um, courses for pre-service teachers to prepare pre-service teachers for their future careers. So I'm gonna go back to the purpose of this panel, how to develop the workforce uh, for AI and machine learning hardware. And to start this conversation, I want to expand this question to how to attract a diverse population to work in creating innovative AI solution for the good of humanity. And uh, so I want to elaborate this statement by focusing on this three axis that you can see here in this slide that uh, obviously it's a very simplified version. Uh, it can be amplified by all of the things that you just mentioned about industry partnerships, government partnerships, but basically I'm gonna be talking about engineering education approaches, personal and professional support, and then K-12 involvement. All right, so let's start with education. How do we create an inclusive learning environment where students are encouraged to creatively think about integrating AI uh, and hardware computing in sustainable and ethically responsible projects. And we can divide this big question into two big dimensions. On one side, we need to foster a hands-on active learning environment through PBL, inquiry-based learning, experiential learning, and gamification. And I want to emphasize the gamification aspect because uh, if you think about the intersection of games and the abstract concepts of uh, AI hardware, this can appear a little bit like unrealistic, but we are indeed creating a set of games that aim to facilitate uh, the interaction with this hardware components using AI and IoT applications in a game-based setting. And uh, we believe that this is a nice thing because we are bringing uh, a hands-on experience to recruit freshmen and sophomores that have no previous experience in hardware. And we believe this is a way to put like that seed in that claim workforce development. So. I wanted to share that with you. But then uh, the second dimension in this big question is that we must reflect on how to facilitate conversations about social responsibility to encourage these students to create solutions that are empowered by AI and machine learning, but that do not lose that human intelligence uh, variable that we need 
like to create projects for the desire of the good of humanity, right? Okay, so let's move to the second axis. And I want to add the support they mentioned to those best practices in engineering education. And what I mean here is the urgency to mentor our students and to provide platforms for mental wellness. So we can create this safe learning environment that allows to demand high performance, but keeping in mind that this pressure indeed is stressful and with the added difficulty and I refer back a little bit to Steve of uh, the nature of engineering tasks that also lead to some isolation. And this can hamper persistence and indeed can lower transition from higher education to industry. All right, and then to close this triangle, I want to stress the importance of K-12 involvement. And this was also mentioned before. How can we promote interest in AI hardware and in K-12 levels? So students consider it as a part, as a path career option, right? So we all know that K-12 curricula are already packed and that K-12 teachers oftentimes are constrained by standards, by uh, core subjects, especially at elementary levels. So then the endeavor will be to design educational hardware platforms that can be scaffold enough to be using K-12. And going back to gamification, how we can facilitate a playful environment where young students can interact with this abstract concepts of physics and maths that are underlying this hardware computing. So they feel they belong. They, be, they feel that they can develop an identity as hardware engineers, and then they can move that into a uh, move that into an engineering agency to pursue a career in hardware computing, right? But then the last but not least in this gift is that we need to prepare in-service and prepare pre-service teachers uh, to create uh, this curriculum that it's like meaningful and suitable for K-12. So we need to provide those spaces for professional development and practice. So K-12 educators are confident to teach hardware AI and they can become like early catalysts of this workforce development. So this is what uh, I had to share today. But Thank you very much for that. Mircea, your thoughts on the topic. Hey, so uh, the, um, the disadvantage of uh, talking late is that there's going to be some level of uh, repetition, but I will try to, to keep it also um, so first, I think we are all in violent agreement, as one of my colleagues say, that we need to start early. Um, and uh, uh, again, I'm kind of older, maybe Steve would also uh, uh, resonate with this, but uh, we used to have this, uh, you know, in the previous century, in the 20th century, where, you know, kids used to play with, uh, you know, in the, with circuits, you know, solder, make radios, make, uh, you know, there was something called heat kit. Uh, so there was a lot of early uh, um, uh, exposure to hardware, to computers, to non-computers, and we lost all of that. And in, in, in uh, you know, uh, ironically, it's partly because uh, we as an industry have become so successful at making our, you know, gizmos user-friendly. So when they are user-friendly, you know, you don't have this need to really understand how they work. They just work when they work. Of course, when they, there is also this new move towards, uh, you know, repairability or the right to repair that I hope uh, picks up because it's a little bit uh, disturbing uh, how badly unrepairable things are. But uh, um, some things that we can do is to try to, uh, you know, uh, fight a little bit against that. But again, this needs to start early. By the time kids come to college, uh, it's very hard. You know, Steve had this notion of filtering versus, it, it, it's very hard. I mean, you know, the, the best you can hope is that they, uh, they are, if they are going to go to engineering, that they are going to do, you know, computer science and software. Uh, it's very hard to attract them at that late stage. Um, some things uh, that, you know, for example, how things work. So we, we have a very successful physics professor here at UVA that has a very successful course uh, called How Things Work. I think if we start doing a little bit of that, you know, with early, uh, you know, kids, uh, maybe we will be able to, uh, you know, make them um, uh, more uh, amenable to 
go into engineering. Uh, it's also, you know, and this was mentioned, it's very important the teachers, the teachers themselves in K-12, they, they are not exposed. So it's, uh, and then, you know, we get to HBCUs and, uh, you know, MSIs. Uh, and even then first semester of college, uh, we, we have that here at UVA, the only engineering discipline that, that they see uh, in the first year is computer science. They, they all do programming, but they don't see anything in electrical engineering and you know, other engineering disciplines. So again, there is this almost uh, you know, uh, impossible to, to uh, reverse, uh, uh, move away from hard engineering. Um, and then uh, also Steve mentioned this, you know, this new uh, job description of prompt engineer. Um, this raises a lot of questions. Uh, you know, in, in many ways of uh, prompt engineering is going to be like writing software. So, you know, everyone writes software, whether you are a chemical engineer or, you know, but then, you know, maybe there is a need for a new discipline. This is going to be an interesting uh, question moving forward. But of course, everything about this is it's for the long term. You know, if we're talking now about doing something in kindergarten, this is going to be you now decades from now, and mm -hmm. we need some kind of a solution for, um, you know, for the short term. And um, since it's unlikely we can make up those tens of thousands of engineers that were mentioned that the industry needs. Um, ironically, uh, it could be that AI itself is going to, to provide uh, maybe to, to relax the needs for, you know, actual people uh, doing some of the work. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a busy uh, slide because it has several points, but uh, on the right, uh, you see a new, you know, this talk was, uh, there, there was an article in com communications of the ACM on this topic, and there was a webinar, I think, yesterday or the day before, uh, where, you know, the uh, Matt Welch made this, uh, uh, you know, a very bold claim that, uh, uh, you know, AI means the end of programming, at least of programming the way we've been doing it, which is, you know, you write code, you write Python, you write C, you write Java, you write something um, and uh, what that means uh, it can mean uh, you know a lot of positive things in terms of the need for people and you you can make the same argument about writing very log and you know writing uh, system very log and writing mm -hmm. you know the HDL and those benches and all that um, and I hope no hardware designer is going to jump on me <laughs> for making those states, but I, I think that's the, that's the actual truth. Um, so, of course, that can mean the exact opposite of what we are worried about, which is not that we need tens of thousands of engineers, but we are going to have tens of thousands of engineers out of jobs. And then, you know, that can actually help with, you know, in the, if there is, you know, a, a, a clear path for those people to be, uh, you know, uh, redirected, um, uh, you know, that may fill some of the gaps that, uh, that we, we have uh, otherwise. Um, the, uh, again, I mean, in terms of FO, the other real danger uh, is a little bit what I alluded uh, about, you know, in my first uh, slide, which is that now uh, by relying on AI, uh, you get even less visibility into the, you know, into the guts of the process. And that can be, you know, quite dangerous uh, moving forward. Um, I, I would like to, uh, you know, I think I have a, a couple more minutes. Um, I, I think it's very important for the industry and the government to um, do a better job, frankly, uh, here, because in, in many ways, uh, universities have been uh, relied upon to, to do, you know, much of this workforce development. Um, and I, I think there needs to be more responsibility uh, and a more engagement. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to sound, but there is, but you know, we need even more. Um, 
and you know there are many things that uh, industry can do uh, and of course there is many, many there are many things that government can do and you know uh, presumably with the, this chips act that we are all excited about uh, you know government is doing uh, but again um, I think it needs to be more of a, a you know multi party uh, uh, collaboration rather than just relying on universities because universities unfortunately are um, uh, you know um, kind of by design they uh, they are not designed to respond in a very uh, fast way uh, to seismic shifts which this AI is you know a seismic shift in uh, uh, in how we are going to do things so I, I think uh, that's pretty much, I mean, I, I have a few more slides, but I think uh, that pretty much takes me uh, for the time. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that thought provoking statement. So now I would like to invite the audience or the panel members who've been itching to ask each other questions. Now's the time. And you can either use the chat function or use the raise hand function in Zoom, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. Well, if, yeah, I'm going to fill up this, this minute of silence if, if, if we don't have one from the audience. And uh... I, I'm too. I'll go Steve to also. <laughs> After you. Okay. Uh, let me uh, uh, let me just throw out a, another concept. Can, my my background. Uh, I was in high school before handheld calculators were popular. What does that mean? I know how to use a slide rule, and in fact, I used a slide rule to actually do work. Okay, so that's how old I am. Couldn't tell from a from a white hair. What does that mean? I I see a, some of these parallels, right? So, gee, when calculators came out, every you know people said, "Oh well, kids are not going to learn how to do arithmetic anymore." Oh, we need to ban these from the classroom. Uh, it was a big deal, and somebody snuck one in. You know, it's like, okay, fine. It's a lot of these arguments sound a lot like the AI arguments. And and so uh, so th this this voice let me let me get this voice from from 50 years ago that says don't don't get your 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 stomach in a knot over this one right yeah the the AI anti hype right uh, is is probably overblown we have seen this before we know how to deal with it and when we come out of it we're going to go through this disruption and we're going to come out on the other side and we're going to have people that much better off it may be hard getting there and maybe we could learn from that experience from decades ago about how to make this transition more effective and that's something we, we could we should be talking about especially in this forum thank you terry you were saying well i had a uh, generally a question for jack and you know, I think in this forum and, and the previous ones that we've participated in relative to workforce development uh, on different topics today, it happens to be machine learning. Um, what's the outcome? You know, what what, what are we going to do? Because I think we all agree, right? There's an issue uh, that's associated with this. And, and I think collectively we can do our individual part. Uh, and um, who was the speaker from Duke University? It was Helen. You know, I love what she's doing right uh, on there. And that would be maybe a good example of, you know, how do we, as a society, how do we duplicate that, you know, hundreds of thousands of times across the U.S.? And so my question for Jack then is, are we taking and rolling up all this information that's been that's been conveyed by the, the, you know, the three weeks of uh, sessions and, and, you know, what's the end result of it all? So that was a Jack, question. You're for speaking, you? you're on mute. That, Judy? <laughs> oh. 
or or anybody that if they have you know from the idea from the uh, from the scales team is this going to get rolled up and uh, you know is the is the effort um, going to get expanded beyond this community? I um, this is Frank. I I have my hand raised. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. I just I have uh, another meeting to dash off on. Is it okay for me to ask a quick question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, so one of the things uh, that's critical, I, I understand what the other guy said, you know, I grew up in an age where, uh, uh, you know, uh, calculators were used. Uh, when I went to school, I'm up here in uh, Cleveland, Cleveland Heights area. Um, we really, as electrical, you had no opportunities uh, to play with circuits and stuff like that, you know, like the biology would have their frog thing and stuff like that. And the science thing, you really never had like a circuits type uh, thing. And I carry this over to the um, general concept of universities. Electrical engineering and computer engineering, they require physical labs. And my experience with administrators in universities, they don't like labs, labs are expensive. They require a lab overseer, stuff like that. So, but labs are the things that do attract people to universities. There was a professor that did a survey and, and he asked students, why did you come to our university as opposed to others? And they said, because of the labs. So labs to me is the is really the game changer and the critical component and, and is a necessary part of the funding on there. And I noticed with the CHIPS Act, they're very heavy into uh, funding um, foundational like infrastructure buildings and stuff like that. And uh, labs, I think is probably a mechanism uh, to get money uh, to to support that type of infrastructure on there. I think without labs, um, that's why software is attractive. It's cheap for the university and the high school. They uh, just get a laptop and you know just download the software and run it. And in fact, but the computer is the student's expense. It's no longer the expense of uh, the school. And maybe virtual labs are good, but it only gets you so far, but it is a good start to put um, circuit engineering as virtual labs. There's a lot of, I, I mean, I love simulation with circuits and stuff like that, but those tools aren't always that great. Uh, you know, there's LT Spice, which may be a little too extreme, but the other educational tools. So those are my thoughts. Uh, I would have loved to have grown up with labs um, in high school, just specialized in circuit design. And I would have loved to have access to um, simulation tools. And they did exist even in my time, but they were expensive on there. So simulation labs, uh, virtual labs on the computer would be the other suggestion. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. So I see another hand raised, Jeremy. You're muted right now. I have to come off mute. It just takes a bit to navigate. Uh, yeah, you know, thanks. I really appreciate it. I'm going to follow up a little bit with the, the comment that was made. And uh, I come from uh, University of Michigan and then MIT Lincoln Laboratory for many years. I was part of helping to work and establish the Beaver Works, which is a collaboration between Lincoln and MIT to create really innovative pro pro projects. Some of those were things like Ackerman steering autonomous racing of scale model UAVs or autonomous racing of UAVs. So we could have it such that AI is this giant hive and everyone's connected and everyone loses their job because it does all the work for us. And we can have it such that things at the edge must require to be operable without the hive, without the, the giant um, you know, brain back there. And so examples of building things that people can see. I mean, I, I have broken knuckles from uh, fixing cars and farm equipment, right? So things that you can see, see how it makes a difference for you and for others are really important. So I think thinking about a lab is also what are those platforms that look like the products that are going to transform how we live at the edge where AI and AI hardware is critical to their success and how robustness of communication back to that, that big brain are critical and must be part of the success of being able to deploy smarts from, from a big, huge resource to the edge. And I think uh, I'm happy to help give you ideas of how to do that, but you've got to make people see like literally this car goes faster. This UAV goes faster autonomously. This thing is safer. And I can be part of building the thing that makes that happen. The thing that's a thousand times more improvement in performance than just code alone. 
And I think that's where you'll start to see, see some big wins. And, and definitely the programs that start to do that a little bit into robotics and the high schools, and, and those are awesome. But there are things at the college level that are, um, that are also really critical to hooking people in those programs early. And last is rational immigration reform has to be part of the solution and target it towards allowing people to become citizens very rapidly, paying for part of their salary and the company that hires them, the full education of a US person in that degree area. And now you have two citizens in that area and the wages haven't collapsed down to uh, one where no one would wanna go take the job after they get their degree, even if it was free. So happy to share my white paper on rational immigration reform and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Let me address the couple of questions that we have in the chat right now. So Payman asked, what steps can be taken to prevent bias in the development of AI ML hardware? And how can the workforce be trained to create such unbiased systems? Would any of the panelists try to tackle well, I that? I can uh, give some hardware perspective. Uh, I think there is this bias that yeah, the new AI ML hardware needs very high density silicon interposers and only TSMC, the Taiwanese company, the giant, only they can do it. And uh, that requires uh, the leading edge wafer foundries and very few people can invest. It's all controlled by Taiwan. Maybe that should be changed that, you know, with the new manufacturing techniques, you know, new panel scale manufacturing techniques with certain uh, scalability, I think there should be more democratization of uh, high density hardware manufacturing. So people can produce that and you know, they call it democratizing. People can produce it independently without relying on this huge, you know, billion dollar wafer foundries with new low cost manufacturing techniques. And that also addresses the question from Avik uh, Ghosh that, you know, uh, we can create that low cost infrastructure so people can prototype or even manufacture at a lab scale with the new techniques like Previously, manufacturing was, you know, only through all these high-tech machines. Now, 3D printing, to some extent, brought it to undergraduate labs, right? Every undergrad lab does 3D printing to make prosthetic hands with controls and all that. But embedding the devices uh, is still, you know, more sophisticated machine. How do you put the 10 micron chiplet or a 5 micron pitch uh, chiplet inside the 3D printed part? So I think there must be new assembly techniques, new assembly hardware so that even that brings the hardware innovation to undergraduate and high school labs, not just a hackathon software innovation. So people can play with their designs, not at software level that anybody can do, but also hardware level. So that low cost manufacturing infrastructure should be sought where people can come up with new design, hardware design, you know, playbook, not just software. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, I also see, I'm oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Suraj, why, why your mic is unmuted? I see you offered an answer to Terry's question. Do you mind summarizing that in the chat? Yeah, I basically I was saying that uh, the goal of scales, and I'm not an authority in scales, so it's all you have uh, led the initiative, but I think <laughs> they are deliberately, I think, trying to develop this uh, new initiative, uh, working with the multiple universities and the communities, local community colleges, along with the infrastructure, through all the you know, investments in semiconductor infrastructure at Bridge Skywater to create this massive renovation in the workforce production. I think to create this huge next generation workforce and also innovate the hardware, very high density silicon interposers, new assembly techniques, new fine pitch interconnections and bring all the hardware manufacturing back to US. So I think exactly scales is trying to address the focus of what the output is from the all these uh, workshops and panel discussions. All right, thank you. Steve, you have your hand up? Yes, uh, I, I want to get back to the, 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 previous, the, the previous question about bias. And uh, I, I interpreted the question perhaps a little bit differently and uh, maybe I'm wrong in my interpretation, but let me say what I think the question was and then I'll say what I think the answer to that question to, to that question. So uh, what I think the question was is, gee, these AI systems are giving us biased results. Uh, it is giving us answers that uh, we don't we don't like. Uh, and so 
let me address that a little bit. So the first, and I'll talk, talk both parts of the question, but uh, what can we do about that and how can we train people? So uh, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, my background was in these systems where uh, you, you built the system, you ran the training set, you observed the result, and a human in the loop made some modifications, and you did that learning with the human brain in the loop. Uh, and the, and the, the machine learning systems remove the human. And so what happens is they they learn how to how to make those decisions, but they learn shortcuts that may not be the right shortcut, right? Oh yeah, the 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 the, the, the cute cat is the one that has a smiley face in the lower right corner. So that's the way to find the cute cats on the internet, right? So uh, so that's one way to do it. But they learn one of the reasons we like these systems is they they're sort of understandable in, in how they learn because they learn sort of like humans do. And then they learn the wrong things like humans do, right? Like the child who you know, never ever saw uh, a cow or a giraffe, right? You know, doesn't know what that is. So the same thing, if the, if the training set doesn't have that in it, what we used to do previously was we'd have a human look at it. So, oh yeah, that we, we didn't write a rule that actually would be, be the right thing. So now we don't have that. Okay. That's what's going on in these systems they're limited by their training set and so and and it's, it's this automated thing so how do we how, how, how can we eliminate that well better training sets humans in the loop uh don't know but we need to acknowledge that they really have learned their training set it's not that they are evil it's just that they're ignorant what can we do in, t in teaching students well, I'm env envisioning a, a, an AI lab that says, okay, well, you've developed your AI engine and now you train it on your, your, your training set and you get some result. Now you train it on 5% of your training set and see what the result is and have the, the students, the learning, see what happens when they have an, an in inadequate training set. I, you know, I just, th just throw, throw it out. Yes, I think we can do things. We can train our next generation AI, en AI engineers to be more sensitive to this. And, and just because they've seen it happen. I mean, I, I saw, yeah, just like we, just as we did well, years ago, scientific programming, and I saw limits of resolution and floating point numbers destroy a calculation, right? So we can see that happen. Yeah, I think we can train them. Thank you. So there's another question on the chat. Maybe it was for Andrea or Helen. Um, how can we work with school board curricula to make sure um, hardware kits make into the curriculum? Because usually there's a lot of software ex exposure for K-12 through 12 um, students. And by the time they got to college, they're already thinking software is way more cool than hardware. Mm -hmm. So what's your answer to that? Um, I actually can extend the, the question and answer a bit and even cover what Stephen talked and previously about the personality. Um, let me uh, quickly share a picture I have an over here. Um, this is in present in five uh, types of uh, uh, like uh, personnel and uh, it's, uh, kind of the surveys and for uh, engineer educations. And this is in shows in um, K-12 and students and interest. What I wanted to say is, and in fact, and for um, us, uh, like uh, working in engineering, and definitely STEM devotees are um, our major focus. And um, there is a large portion of uh, uh, students and who uh, seems and do not know what they wanted to do. Uh, we call that engaged or exercised and, and focused, and right. And these and um, perhaps in the people that we can work on. Um, and it depends on personalities. I know a lot of people are social artists. Uh, they uh, by nature are more interested in art and science and music and, and perhaps and it's very hard to convert the students into the engineer. Another observation in fact is and while a lot of them are enjoying STEM, um, they're when asking whether they're interested in becoming to an engineer and comparably the interesting rate and uh, decreases. So this actually comes back to my previous and uh, kind of an, uh, our approach, like uh, we need to create the channels and uh, engage this is students who have a potential and uh, uh, kind of keep the channel open um, and made them kind of uh, engaged with us. 
So um, I can give if another example, I don't have a, a slice on with me um, at the Duke and uh, engineering schools, and we have a first year uh, design um, uh, course and project, and it's a mandatory for all the engineering students. And in this uh, first year design course, and they ask to master at least two uh, skills, right? Microcontroller um, is the skills and um, like is selected by 80% of students. And this is not just the for like ECE, it's an across engineer. So 80% of students are interested in um, knowing more about the microcontroller. And then 60% of students are interested in like a 3D printing. And so the others and kind of a less. So what I wanted to say is, and if you're really looking at the younger student size and the interest is there, okay. And uh, uh, I'd say uh, we wanted to build and push and the pull mechanisms and um, like and for the younger students and we our first year design basically say hey you know we're trying to give you uh, components and you build things and um, with the very detailed instructions and you see what's going on so um, this is an, a very clear design the projects and with a little uh, for the students with a little knowledge about engineering. Um, but later on, then we have an um, like senior designs or other designs and to help the students and improve their skills. And so um, I think in such kind of a procedure like from easy to the harder and um, you know uh, many years ago uh, our graduate students and or senior students have the opportunities to submit their VSI design chips and for fabrication and testing that's a big achievement for the students and now the um, uh, opportunity is very little and very hard to do this. As you can see, many of our students are interested, um, but uh, you know uh, the, uh, the 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 channel uh, you know need to be rebuilt so on the other hand I forgot maybe Jerry mentioned about the the salary the the job market and it seems like a job market is there because when students and choose the areas and a uh, job market definitely will affect their uh, you know uh, final selection and that's why I guess one of the reasons and not many students are so interested in the uh, engineer if we show the promise picture is there and with all this and hardware pay, um, and eventually it's last to a high profit, uh, you know, a job market, and then all this, um, you know, uh, meaningful. And for us and at universities, then we do need all this and, um, investment from government and support from the industry. Like in the question talking about the, um, uh, the kids and, you know, uh, Raspberry Pis and, um, Arduino and so on so first, and these are our stepping stones and, and tools to uh, developing this and uh, gradually um, uh, kind of a more and more complicated and projects and mechanisms to help students to learn um, and also continued interest in in uh, engineering. Well, um, I mean, a little bit tied to back to AI hardware. Um, in fact, um, uh, when I was a student and developing hardware was extremely hard, you must uh, took years since to getting kind of close to the hardware levels. With software uh, support, uh, with this, um, um, who mentioned about the virtual tools and, um, and also AI hardware, and the things actually getting easier. Our current task is easier, not harder than before. It's uh, just the, the other areas becomes an, um, even um, easier than us. And that's our challenge. And uh, if we can do some things in, uh, to uh, you know, lower the gap, and I think that there's a still chance for us. And I, yeah, Andrea. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add to that, uh, and this expands a little bit how uh, Terry is concerned about how to move forward. And I guess that we as a like, special group of interest, uh, one of the ways we can move forward this is preparing teachers. So I wanna share an example in our teacher preparation program uh, in the College of Education, we have specific courses to teach our pre-service teachers to integrate CS and CT into their classrooms, right? We have CS micro-credentials, uh, we have CS professional development, like all over the place. We have support from code.org, support from CS4O, uh, so all of these initiatives are 
making this software related topics a little bit more of interest for pre-service and in-service teachers. So if we want to really infuse this into K-12, we need to prepare our teachers to be able to teach this to the kids. Thank you, thank you. So while the panelists were talking, there was a little bit of background chat going on in the chat room between Jeremy and Raj. So Jeremy offered his insights and resources on the Minifab and 3DHI software capabilities. And there was a um, question from Raj out there. So um, we have only a couple of minutes. Um, Raj or Jeremy, do you want to um, share your thoughts or uh, verbally <laughs> so everyone can hear it? Now, my only comment was uh, such kind of uh, 3D heterogeneous integration interconnect platforms will be very useful to study new design architectures so we don't have to build a complex interconnect network. We can just borrow them from global foundries and we can now evaluate different design options. So it's a very nice accelerated research uh, option. Okay, thank you. Okay. I um, wanted to throw, throw out one other, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Gloria, you had something else or another comment? Um, I think there was a comment on the chat whether payments question was answered, and I believe it was. That was the bias in AI and ML, which Steve and Raj answered. So we, I think we can go to your comment, Steve. That, let me, uh, so I'm going to put on my, my commercial industry hat for a moment and give a perspective from there. And uh, it's maybe not the one you thought, but the perspective is we are trying this is a marketing problem right so we tend to engineers and look at things as engineering problems like that's all i'm going to solve this this problem but in fact how do you attract people to the industry how do you how do you, how do you train them this is a marketing question and so so anyway squinting at this and saying it's a marketing question there are actually two parts of of mar you know there's a lot of marketing but there's inbound marketing which says what do they want and there's outbound market is tell them what they want, right? So the inbound marketing says, what do they want? And, and we started, we talked about what's happening in grade schools and high schools and uh, undergrad and graduate degrees and what they want. It's sort of my, my observation and my semi-marketing hat. There's different things at different points. What they want is different. They, uh, and what, and then the other side is, uh, so grade schools, they're, they want to have fun. High school, it, ha it, it has to do something for them and they wanna see something that's gonna change the world. Undergraduates, they wanna get a job uh, and make money. And graduates, and then I'm, I'm simplifying this, right? And graduates, they wanna work on interesting problems. So, so there's there different things. So how do we market this? I mean, so we could do more inbound marketing. Then how do we market this? How do we tell them what they want? And the other part of, of uh, something is in, uh, you know, you gotta close the sale. So there's a sales aspect of this. How do you close the sale? And so the sales guys say, well, you need to have, uh, you need to have an app note. You need to have, say, how this product solves your problem. Okay, so things like, gee, if we wanna put this into grade schools, we're gonna have to have the how. Uh, my teacher is a fifth, my, my daughter is a fifth grade teacher. And uh, so, uh, yeah, she was, uh, uh, you know, the teachers at that level, they are not the strong math science types. Uh, they, you know, they were they were teaching because they wanted to teach rather than rather than do that other stuff. So you have to package that. And as someone else said, the curriculum is really full. They have they have all the checkbox they have to do for the state. Their curriculum is really full. Uh, high schools. How do we how, how do we change the world? Andre had some really good comments about this. How do we change the world? By the time they get the undergraduates, they're looking a little bit beyond that, especially those who came from a background where money was very tight. Uh, they are very aware of what they want to do. And so part of the, this part of its marketing is, is, is this inbound and outbound. And part of it is creating our own narrative. We can't sit back and let somebody else say, gee, chat GPT emits as much carbon as all the airline industry which is false, but you can't even let that even, even start. And you have to focus on the positives of this technology. Where is this, where is this electronics technology going? 
how much how much carbon does it save because of because of transportation? It's a marketing question, and we need to get ahead of that marketing message for all levels. So anyway, that's a uh, little so, different perspective. So I'll, I'll echo on what Steve said, and and part of telling them what they want is is what do we need, right? I mean, we need certain things as a as an industry, right, for talent uh, to continue, you know, our uh, our leadership in this area. So, you know, part of it is we we need to have that marketing on, hey, these are the types of things we need to go forward. And, and it's really cool. And all those things that Steve mentioned. Yeah, it, yeah you look at, you know, what, so, you know, the engineers I hired, what was I looking for? Relevant ex experience, because I needed somebody to hit the ground running, uh, has to be flexible, because in five years, what I need is different than what I have now. Uh, has to show initi initiative. Right. And have to have some excellence. I got something I know I can turn this person just to rely on. And so these are these are attributes of, of, of how to do that. How do we get how do we get that? Uh, it's been the particularly difficult one, I think, from an educator's point of view, is the relevant piece. So how do we get something somebody who, who has a, a little touch of relevant expertise um, when we know this industry is fickle and uh, and and they move and they what they want is going to change? Uh, that, that's that's probably the tighter collaboration uh and uh yeah yeah absolutely we need to we need to look at that where they where are they going what is this what is the product you know commercial industry what is the product we're making and how do we make it valuable on the other end okay so in the remaining six minutes we're going to have each panelist um offer their final concluding remarks and we're going to go in the reverse order this time out of fairness so I'll take Mircea first. Please go ahead. And please unmute okay. yourself, please. Okay. <laughs> yes, 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 thank you. So uh, it, it is interesting uh, how much convergence, uh, you know, we had in this panel. Uh, I, it, it was a little bit more than what I expected. Um, uh, what I think is missing still is uh, action items. So I think, uh, we kind of agree on the principles. We kind of agree on, you know, what needs to happen. Um, how to make that happen, though, it's uh, it's going to be the real uh, the real uh, conundrum. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, again, this um, um, you know, <laughs> marketing works. Uh, but uh, you know, when I look at myself, you know, I don't think there was any marketing in getting me interested in, you know. Uh, soldering, uh, you know, a few resistors and transistors to make, uh, you know, a radio. And uh, so, um, uh, it, you know, we, we need to tap into that kind of inner uh, curiosity of kids. And, you know, maybe that is marketing, but, you know, it's, it's actually a little bit more fundamental. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, and, and again, uh, AI, uh, like I said, is both a friend and a foe. I think, um, you know, uh, the feeling, this weird feeling that there is something behind that uh, thing that really thinks and speaks like a human uh, should be enough, uh, you know, uh, provide enough excitement uh, to attract, uh, you, know, uh, you know, people in that direction, uh, maybe more than the more geeky, you know, integrated circuits with FEDs and all that, which are a little bit uh, abstract and you need to be a little bit uh, of a geek. So so we, we do have an opportunity that, you know, the CS people had with software, now with AI to kind of use AI uh, to do the work for us. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. That's exactly a minute. Thank you. Andrea? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take it from Marge, uh, Mircea, <laughs> sorry. And uh, well, I believe industry is demanding, uh, like it's growing faster than what we can do in universities, what we can do in engineering education, what we can do in research. So I guess uh, like defining those actionable items and creating this interest group that move initiatives forward is something that needs to happen in the near future if you really want to translate all of the things that we're doing in education into like a industry, like a bigger workforce uh, in the industry with these hardware engineers, so. Thank you. Raj, final <clears throat> remarks? 
Yeah, uh, I think hardware manufacturing, uh, bringing them to US is a major uh, challenge. It's important, it's very important. Just to put in the perspective, you know, chips come from Taiwan, packaging materials come from Japan, the substrates are made in you know, China or and assembly happens in China. So how do you bring this to US? And when it's already dominated by them. So that requires the uh, infrastructure uh, paradigm shift. It requires new manufacturing challenge techniques that need to be invented indigenously, bringing a lot of uh, local workforce. People need to be aware of this opportunity. They need to be playing a role in this instead of you know, just letting uh, doing some software jobs. So people need to be aware of this. So we need to bring it to young people's awareness that there's a major opportunity to innovate uh, hardware for all these AI and ML so that you, know, you retain all these uh, sophisticated jobs and that is, the, I think, the endeavor that we need to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Helen? Um, I think, um, well, I think in um, educational uh, workforce development is an evolving questions. It's changing with the time, with the uh, situation. Um, but generally speaking, so I think the skill and the sustainabilities are always in key questions to ask. How can we uh, supply uh, and maintain um, the skill and ensure the efficiency during the execution? Um, considering the right now, uh, everything is changing so fast and considering the uh, ChatGPT uh, AI machine learnings and I think in close um, engagement with the industry, and also strong support uh, from the government will be essentially very, very important for university to make decision and uh, um, you know, support back to uh, government and uh, our industry. We're looking forward to working with all the parties. Okay, we have Terry next. So I think uh, as we pointed out, uh, AI, uh, machine learning, you know, it's a generational change in, in um, the way that we're gonna see the, uh, the future. Um, it creates short-term and long-term uh, challenges for industry, short-term wise. Um, you know, we have uh, the lack of uh, sufficient engineers going through 2030, as I mentioned before. Uh, companies uh, like Synopsys are trying to bridge that with uh, AI and ML to increase the productivity of existing engineers. Longer term, then, uh, you know, we have to work with uh, with the uh, universities, the K through 12, with the government to uh, try to encourage kids to go into STEM, right? And once we get more kids into STEM, then we'll have more opportunities to filter the kids into uh, engineering, computer science, uh, things that uh, achieve in our industry. And then I'll just leave you with with one thing that was interesting I, I had seen recently on, on AI, and that is that Walmart currently uses AI as part of their negotiating uh, tool. And essentially what they do with their suppliers is they use AI, they, they, you know, they fill in the parameters of what their business terms are, conditions of sale, the price that they'd want, and then they let the AI bot go out and negotiate with suppliers. And once they start that process, there's no human in the loop. The result of the negotiation is the result of the negotiation. And Walmart's finding this to be terrifically uh, uh, supportive of their environment. And then uh, statistically, 75% of the suppliers actually like working with the AI bot because it takes out the emotion and all the, the latency where they're getting things done now in days instead of weeks or months, the way the previous process works. So, you know, AI is here, it's here to stay. Got to get used to it. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I wonder if those uh, AIs are negotiating with the supplier's AI. Uh, I, and there really is no human in the loop. <laughs> maybe, maybe that might be the next thing, Steve. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, first of all, it's just the uh, AI machine learning, it's here, it's here to stay. Um, and like previous uh, revolutions and the, you know, calculators and so on, uh, yes, uh, we all find it disruptive because we're the old guard. Uh, and uh, the in a few years, the people who grew up with it will find it very natural and, and be, be able to work with it. So uh, uh, don't get, uh, we can't get too worked up about that, but we do have to find the, the, the new normal in there. It, as engineers, we, we know that the easiest way to the solution is the, is the right way to the solution, I suppose, by the way you do that. And so it's going to be used. And whether it's Walmart uh, or 
Copilot, or it's I'm going to write, I'm going to have Chat GPT write my next grant proposal. Uh, it's here, and and so that's fine. Uh, and and this this is actually a really excellent panel to highlight how do we, you know, given that it's here, uh, how do we work with this effectively? How do we get it to do what we want done? And, and that's what engineers do. So. The next part of that is is uh, I want to see us control our narrative. I am concerned with the uh, anti-technology hype. I've always been concerned with anti-technology hype. There was a whole lot of that when I was in high school. Um, and uh, it was tough to be a technology guy and a nerd back in the 70s. Uh, yeah. That A few internet billionaires cured that uh, somewhat. Uh, but... Uh, but yeah, I'm concerned about that. And if we want to motivate this generation to get involved, we have to be sure that we are giving the positive side of that, whether it's salary and that appeals to some, saving the planet and that appeals to some, uh, carbon reduction, that appeals to some, uh, whatever, making the future, these things we have to be able to do. And, uh, and we have to be able to train engineers that are broad enough because there's going to be something after the AI cycle. Uh, and then the final thought is there is no crime in educating a whole generation that even aren't engineers in science and technology understanding. So if we get out there and uh, that when we have a lot, lot of students get exposed to this to, the, the technology, but they become teachers, great. Yeah, they become historians, great. They become psychologists, great. Uh, yeah, no problem uh, teaching everybody. Just expose a lot more people to this yeah. technology. Yeah, the pie gets bigger, the bigger our opportunity base is, for sure. And and our society benefits from more people with critical thinking skills and some sort of math skills in their heads to know when somebody's lying to them on the TV. So, okay, that. we're a bit over time, but I see Mark is here, so I'll have him say a few words and actually close this final workforce development um, session. So I must say, listening to the conversation, I actually don't know what, what I can add. The uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, they offer a lot more than what I can do, but uh, let me first, uh, by thanking the panelists, uh, uh, I know I know everybody has uh, uh, um, uh, quite a bit on their plate. I see the apartment chairs and I don't know how, Helen, you are still doing it and showing up in the panel, but uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, and 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 everybody else that I know personally very well. So thank you for joining. Thanks, Europe. Thanks, Gloria, for for scheduling this. Um, workforce is 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 important to you guys. is important to us as well. It's tremendous uh, tremendous amount of challenge. Uh, we keep talking about uh, in general trainees, right? But when it comes to workforce. Uh, we need trainers, and unfortunately, there's not enough investment. So we say we we, we want 250,000 trainees uh, and talents and semiconductors. I can assure everybody there's not enough people out there to teach 300, 250,000 people. Um, I can't even go to my department faculty and ask them to teach one extra course. Helen knows exactly what I'm talking about because there's no way that we could do that unless we actually add more people to do it. And to add more people means more resources. And I keep talking to government about this notion of they believe that we have enough resources somehow magically coming out of the department and they show up and teach all the courses that we should be teaching. It's just not the case. Government, federal, state, they also need to invest in, in, uh, in, in tra trainers as much as we do trainees. And discussions around chat, GPT, AI, ML basically could play actually some, some role here. Uh, I do believe that uh, workforce, until we put together a good consortium around industry, government, and when I say government, it means the state and federal and, and academia, um, we do a lot of lip service, but the ultimate goal may not necessarily be accomplished. So it's very important we all get together. And I hope one outcome of this, this, this effort that Sorup and team and you guys are putting in place is to establish something bigger than what we individually working on. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate your hard work and I appreciate Sorup for inviting me to give a couple of minutes of my thoughts. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all. There were unanswered questions in the chat, but I guess we'll have to take it up later offline.
Swarup, do you have any remarks since I No, um, I really want to thank everyone, Gloria. Thanks for doing a wonderful job as always. And of course, uh, the final word would be that this is a very important topic. We need to collaborate. We need to work together to solve this, this important topic for, for the next generations to come. With that, um, I would ask you to take home this, the, the problems we discussed and the important uh, directions which the, the, the distinctive panelists, the distinguished panelists pointed to, to take them home. And, and of course, uh, let's work together to solve some of these these problems. So with that, um, wherever, depending on wherever you are, um, have a great day or a great evening. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Good to see Bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank I you. Good to see you again.